Alright guys, Dieter here. We got some very special guests with us today. Nobody else than the founder and now the CCO, the Chief Creative Officer of Untapped. Welcome, Greg. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, tell us a bit. You founded Untapped. You started in your uh, living room. <laughs> yeah, so on top was, uh, you know, a brainchild of myself, and my co-founder, and we basically were thinking about Foursquare. Foursquare was an app about 10 years ago. We checked into places and whatnot. Uh, we thought about that being an inherently in social experience, but it left us lacking with a lot of things we wanted to add on top of it. I mean, no one really cared if you went to a supermarket, for example. But if you went to a bar or a restaurant, what did you actually do there? So that was the key thing that we wanted to kind of showcase with the Untapped product. And we thought of uh, industries that were inherently social and beer came to mind as that particular uh, uh, piece that had a very social aspect of drinking with friends in real life, but the online version of that, the real time didn't exist. So we kind of married those two things together of the, the check-in system with Foursquare into untapped. And that's kind of where it all began. Uh, we started doing it part-time uh, on the side for a project of five and a half years. And, you know, uh, we've been able to grow from, from uh, you know, one user to almost 8 million now today. So it, it's pretty crazy to see the growth and how work they put into it um, that pay off in the end. Yeah, indeed. Um, you all, we're talking now about 2010, of course. Eh? Um, the internet was totally a different place. We didn't have uh, web and frameworks like it was now. What was the tech stack you used in the beginning? Yeah, so we used, um, we were a mobile web app. So we first launched back in 2010. You could just go to uh, untap.com on your mobile phone and you'd be able to just use the app in your browser. So we were a web-based app, which didn't really exist back then. It was really in the app store or nothing. So we kind of wanted to go a different route. Uh, number one, because we didn't really have the experience from being mobile developers on the native platform. We were more web developers. Uh, but on number two, we wanted the widest number of users to be able to use it on day one. And while the app store is nothing like it was 10 years ago, at the time, the web was your biggest marketplace in a sense where you're able to go and any phone, any, any platform and just use the app to your your likeness. So yes, it was a, a traditional tech stack that we used. We were Apache, MySQL, PHP yeah. kind of situation. We're uh, traditionally not, that now again, but more, um, you know, we do different databases and stuff like that. But in the very beginning, we were a simple uh, jQuery application. We load the content right inside of it and play, play it like that. So you know, we use that as an opportunity to kind of figure out what we wanted to do and improve on it. Uh, and then, you know, continue to build on that platform. Yeah. And the users in uh, that time, was it just you and your friends? So how did you start with, this, with the first users? Yeah, so we started with just our friends and family. Uh, we we partnered with a bunch of, uh, at the time, there were a bunch of Foursquare blogs uh, and communities out there because our platform was so similar to Foursquare. So we partnered with them to say, hey, here's some beta codes to to play around with the app and for your user base and your community and try to market the, the app that way. We got our first big break on Mashable uh, with November of, of 2010 where they wrote a story about us and that kind of skyrocketed our, our user growth from that perspective um, to get us out there um so that was a lot of fun and exciting but yeah it started out there and just kind of grow, grown and grown and grown we started partnering with breweries uh and you know also too uh, craft beer was just booming at that particular time too which we fed in pretty nicely in that kind of equation you know people weren't sharing tiktoks or snapchats back then it was simply just a kind of facebook and twitter world so we were always curious if people would actually voluntarily share their beer that they had on on a social network and share with the world and it proved out to be pretty successful from that perspective yeah. did you also do the network events and the startup events and the accelerator things that after 2010 uh, were more common to do we actually didn't. Uh, we were a, uh, you know, we had finished school. We, we had a family. So we kind of did it on the side. We didn't do any incubators or anything of that nature. Uh, we simply wanted to to build something and, and really kind of attach yourself to a social kind of community of, of people. And the funny thing is neither my co-founder or myself 
uh, were into beer at the time. We made the app knowing that we want to get into beer and use it as a platform for ourselves to discover new beer out there. So if it works for us, it feels like it worked for a lot of people as well. So it was a kind of interesting perspective on uh, going down that route, but everything was bootstrapped on our own. Uh, and uh, we just kind of continue to grow our platform uh, as much as we could with the funds that we have. From the beginning, you made a minimal viable product as I want to make a product later to grow it, to companize it, or was it, no, I just want this for myself, I didn't make an MVP and what's out there is out there. We did do an MVP. Uh, it was a very basic project to see if it would stick within the the, uh, the community with our beta testers. Um, our first version of the Untapped app didn't have any ratings, didn't have anything but adding a beer in a location and a comment of what you thought of the beer. So very minimal from that perspective. You know, if, if I sit here and tell you that, did I think that we would be a, a big company with 70 plus employees now and multiple offices all around the world. No, <laughs> I don't think anybody can tell you those things from the very beginning, but we did have a strategy for how we wanted to make a little bit of, of revenue. Uh, we always thought that we'd be able to sell our badges or digital achievements in the application to, per, to prospective uh, sponsors and things of that nature. Um, but we didn't really know what that would look like. Um, you know, we also wanted uh, breweries to be able to claim their pages and potentially add on some add-ons to that. So we had some long-term visions to make it into it to a company but you know from the very beginning we we're focused mainly on user growth and community from that perspective yeah that's clear um in terms of growth that all came naturally when you started in 2010 or were the moments like oh it's not catching up i want to quit um, i'm stop this hobby project and i develop something else or it's kind of yeah i know right when uh, we got the article for um, Mashable uh, in November of that year of 2010 right, to, to skyrocket and it continued to grow and grow from that perspective. That was our first kind of like fire start firecracker to get it, get it all moving and it continued to grow at a rapid rate and never really kind of went down from that perspective. So, you know, we're very fortunate um, to have that kind of break in the very beginning, but I think one of the testaments of what we're trying to do is listen to the community, make, make improvements, feedback, and really keep the community at the forefront of what we were trying to accomplish. And ultimately craft beer was very inherently uh, uh, big at that time. So we kind of rode that wave as well. As people try to discover new beers out there, they were able to do those things more effectively within the application. Yeah. So the growth was really like popping up and keeps, it was there always then. Yeah, it was always continuing to grow. Uh, um, and, and new users came in over and over again. I think we had to you know, build out our features. And we didn't release a native application until a couple of years down the road. So we kept building out our mobile uh, platforms and continue to improve that. Um, we didn't even have an untapped.com website until probably six or eight months into the actual project. We were mainly focused just doing the mobile side for the check-in. So we were mobile first and focusing on that. But the internet world and the computing world as it is today, 10 years later, is completely different than it was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, you know, jQuery mobile, which is not even used that much anymore, wasn't even a thing. I mean, there wasn't anything called, uh, it wasn't any uh, Ionic platform, which is what we use today. There wasn't Angular or Vue or, or any of these JavaScript frameworks, they, they just didn't exist. Uh, so we were kind of doing a lot of that stuff on our own to see uh, what actually worked, what didn't work. And I think that that's kind of helped us because, you know, back then everyone made an app for one platform and they only did it to another platform once they got bigger. And for us being on day one, being on all the major platforms, helped us gain the users from the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Uh, using web platforms was really the way to go. Uh, if you see it now, uh, all the native apps, it's double work most of the time for code. Uh. Yeah. Uh, what about internationalization? So you had your product, it was successful, it uh, catched growth. Internationalization, different languages um, from left to right, uh, stuff like that. Was that a huge refactor? Was it let's start again from scratch with a new framework or? Uh, well, we actually rolled out native languages. Uh, we support four or five now, I believe, within the application about a year and a half ago. So it took us a little bit of time to get to that level. But, you know, most of the countries over in Europe and in the UK, you know, the top five uh, cities in the app, for example, we have New York, Chicago, London, Amsterdam, and uh, I forgot the last one there. Uh, but, you know, we're seeing a lot of growth internationally from that perspective, and mainly predominantly English-speaking countries. But we do have the app now 
in Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, uh, and German as well. So we're trying to, to, to move toward internationalization uh, for those languages. We also support a lot of customs push notifications in those languages as well. So you've taken a stamp to kind of get people on the platform that may not be uh, used to, um, you know, using the app and understanding our lingo to be in those particular languages to kind of move forward from it. So it's been very successful in those areas, specifically in those things that we just discussed. Yeah. And in terms of linking to other social networks, let's say um, Asian and China market, Chinese Facebook, let's say Ren Ren, is that something you're also looking forward to expand your map more to that? Yeah, it's definitely something we're looking into for sure. I think one of the biggest improvements we made in the last couple of years is that we've moved off of Google Maps for our mapping libraries to OpenStreetMaps, which allows people in uh, ch countries that Google is blocked to be able to use our mapping function. So that's been a really big improvement there for our national region. But right now, we just share mainly to Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Foursquare as well. Uh, we also do Instagram sharing for stories and also for content as well. Maybe in the future, we'll be adding additional parameters for that. But right now, that's what we're focused on. Yeah, okay. Uh, in terms of uh, agility, how agile was untapped due to uh, new GDPR legislation or to the pandemic? Is it switch over, refactor or...? We always believed in user privacy from the very day, first day that we started. So we, you know, when a user, you know, most networks, when you delete your account, they don't actually delete your information. They just keep it there in an active state or what they call on the... The, the, the program on a soft delete of your application. We don't really believe in that. When you tell us you're deleting your account, we remove everything that's corresponding to your particular information. So the only GDPR compliance we had to do was create a way where we can actually generate reports back to users and wanted it from their information uh, due to the legislation there. So it wasn't very difficult to do that because we're already kind of complying to that with some aspect. Um, but you know, uh, we really believe in the user choice and the community and that perspective. So if you tell us to delete your data, we're going to delete all, all retrobind data points already for you. So that's kind of how we were able to kind of iterate that. And COVID, you know, from that perspective, it's, it's very difficult. We're, our, our main app and our main point of business is that we sell to bars and restaurants for uh, a software called Untap for Business, which allows them to do um, uh, menu publications, digital displays, things like that. So once COVID kind of hit, everyone wasn't going to bars and breweries and restaurants anymore because they were all closed. So we had to find ways to kind of encourage people to find, uh, find beer out there for delivery or for pickup or the you know, online ordering. So we created things like, um, uh, something called Greg's list, which is kind of like a really quick hack together system. All the venues that we have in our system, whether they're doing uh, delivery or things that like people get out there to support the local businesses. And we also introduced something called untapped at home, which is a special global venue that everyone can check into on the service that kind of encourages safe drinking, drinking in your house and, and, and whatnot. So they're really big, big uh, return on, on those uh, features we've added to the app to deal with COVID. And it's not over yet. Obviously the U S is still kind of uh, recovering as well over in Europe is getting a little bit better because you guys are got got it first before us. Um, but we're still constantly trying to improve these and make it uh, better for when the when COVID kind of lifts and we're able to do things from more closer to home. Yeah, yeah, that's clear. Um, so the app growth. Um, what changed in the technology stack then? I assume you did less SQL, less PHP, and more modern frameworks uh, jamming into it. Yeah, for us, we don't really believe in like using the flavor of the week when it comes to uh, technology because it's a JavaScript framework that comes out every day, it seems like nowadays. But we use what works for us in terms of, of the tech stack. So we're still using PHP for our primary data, uh, our primary uh, programming languages. We also use um, the uh, MySQL uh, as our database primary store. But we've definitely upgraded some of our other data sets to use things like MongoDB, Redis, Elasticsearch, and things like that to kind of accelerate our process uh, going forward uh, we've obviously migrated our apps using um, you know more modern frameworks uh, we're still a hybrid application using ionic and angular as our main main position there uh, but yeah we, we've definitely upgraded things as we've gotten more attuned to the technology um, you know we use elastic search a lot for analytical purposes i think it's really fast for counts and things like that um, we use algolio for all of our in-app searches and web searches that are really fast 
client side searches from that perspective. So there's a lot of things we've improved upon as technology has kind of come to the forefront of that situation. Um, so yeah, we've, we've definitely been abreast of this, but we're just not a, we don't just use something because, oh, PHP, nobody uses that anymore. It works for us. So we end up using it in that aspect. Of course, we've upgraded it and, and using frameworks, um, MVP, MVC frameworks, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, basically what we've been able to kind of accomplish with that platform. Yep. What uh, database wise, so you're still using Mongo and Elastics, you have an overlap in that you run it now on cloud, so you started on a rack on a server. How did cloud? We were start we, we started out yeah, we started out as basically having a shared environment, shared hosting, and that didn't last very long uh, as we grew and whatnot. Uh, but you know, we 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 used the technology for what it works for us. So for Mongo, for example, we use it for a lot of geospatial queries. That's what's known for us. What it's good for the indexes are very powerful. You know, Redis we use that for fast counting. So things like counters for beer beer check ins and brewery check ins, you just use it there. And Elasticsearch is mainly used as a cache for some in some aspects of storing users, users uh, beer IDs for quick searching or something along those lines. So, you know, we've now moved into the cloud or in AWS and, uh, you know, we're using all their, their powerful resources there for auto scaling and other things. But we also use some of their uh, kind of high-end machine learning um, elements to help us kind of situate things better. So, for example, we have our our labels on our app that have a very distinct look and feel. We don't do like uh, bottles or cans. It's just the labels. So we actually use um, their product called recognition to detect when a user uploads a particular label for a beer to detect actually a full label representation and not a bottle or a picture of a glass and a beer to help us kind of situate that a little bit better. So we've definitely adapted things as we've gone forward to make sure that we can use those products to better make the images standard across the board. Oh, very cool. Uh, gamification, the badges, the points. Uh, when did you start with that? Was that a choice in the beginning or that evolved more? Yeah, so badges uh, were from Foursquare. It was it was a ripoff, for lack of a better word, but they did. Uh, we felt that we could do it a little better with some of the uh, achievement-based systems in the app. And our goal with the badges is to get you outside your comfort zone. So try an IP that you never had before or Stout. Um, so that's always been there. We've never really believed in points or uh, checked in the most amount of beers or leadership boards or something like that because we didn't want to encourage the wrong messaging when it came to drinking beer. Uh, but we've also uh, done a lot when it comes to being badges for all sorts of holidays and things like that. So um, trying to incorporate a lot of fun within the application and make it interesting for users to kind of go out to their comfort zone and collect these things. You know, we've created this system where people really get into the badges and really want to earn all of them. And, uh, you know, that creates a kind of a cool aspect there, but we want to be careful about the things that we push out there and make sure that we do them in the right way for the community and, as well as not creating a, a, an app for binge drinking or anything of that nature is something we're really passionate about as well. Yeah, true. Uh, tasting profiles that people can measure more the tasting profile of the beer more on an academic way instead of the gamification. Is that something you try to do? Yeah, so tasting profiles are you know, rating toward like a different taste, color, smell, things of that nature. We, we always look at untapped as a easy way to get involved in the beer community. We've kind of modeled off of other networks that were kind of a little more intensive for lack of a better word, which is nothing wrong with that. But we want to give everyone the opportunity to kind of go through their beer journey to see what they like, what they don't like. Uh, and really having a simple rating system to do that, which is why we started with just one to five. And we've obviously gone uh, from half stars to quarter stars where they are today. And then we have a premium feature on the app that you can rate on the point one star on uh, the scale decimal. But we just wanted to give everyone opportunity to kind of think too 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 closely about about their beer and really kind of just give it a quick information i think most people out there will be able to say i know what a 3.25 is versus a four but when you get down to a really nitty-gritty 100 point scale it's high for someone to be like oh yeah that was definitely a 97 oh no i think it's 94 i mean that's very hard for people to kind of understand from that aspect so we're trying to keep it simple and get a lot of data out of that for more ratings uh, opportunities we'll, we'll do less rating if they don't really understand the system that's in there yeah. To pick a bit on, on data, you now also have an API. Is there also a data warehouse above and depth that you open to, let's say, industrial players or uh, people that want data from that? 
Yeah, we're definitely building out something along that, that area. Not much to say on that just yet, but we're definitely building out. We have a lot of data that's come in. We're close to 90, 900 million check-ins, uh, almost a billion check-ins that will happen hopefully next year. It'll be awesome. Uh, and never in a million years I thought that would ever happen, but yes, we're getting close. But yeah, we have definitely have a data warehouse there. We use Redshift for that implementation there within AWS. And uh, we're definitely building out things to make uh, decisions and data decisions much easier for breweries in the future. Yeah. You see that as more as a product, as a kind of dashboard to offer to your customers? I see more as a product. Uh, definitely something that we're looking to kind of to help brewers make better decisions about where to go and where to market. I mean, you think about it logically, like the big breweries have spent millions of dollars on focus groups. Some people saying, hey, is this beer good or bad? We have all that data and it's done in a raw fashion. Uh, how can we algorithm that together to make better decisions such as, hey, I'm launching a cider. Where in the world should I put my brewer? Where should I put, uh, market my product to? I think a lot of that is based on you know data that they don't have right now. We're hoping to help them uh, do that better. Our whole system is kind of like a, a big circle in a sense. We want users to be able to find that beer. We want the breweries to make the beer and know what the customers think about it so they can make better beer and it passes all around the equation there. So that is a very important part to our ecosystem here to make sure that we're able to give every part of that person equation uh, value so they continue to use the service um, for that use. Yep. So the Google Analytics of Brewers is coming. Yeah, hopefully, right? <laughs> right. Um, so, of course, you have to find staff, you have to find good people. You started that uh, 10 years ago in your basement. How was it to find your first people to hire? You go to friends or...? Yeah, so in 2016, uh, we merged with a company called Next Class, which is a small company that did sim something similar to us, but they had a lot of capital and um, we had a lot of users and it kind of was a, a match make in heaven from that perspective because we were able to get use that those uh, um, the, the funds there to kind of grow our team. We started with our sales team. Ultimately, growing our sales team there was important to get the word out about Untapped Business, our main kind of business product that we do sell. So, you know, we, we have really high standards when it comes to bringing people in. We want people to be passionate about the things they do. And one of the things that people that know about me is that I'm really passionate about this industry. As you can see with my background here of all my beer labels on my board here is that we want to find people that are similar to that trying to disrupt the beer industry uh, to make it a really great place for everyone to kind of come together. So find the right people that have the same values as you and also the same um, methodologies toward the beer industry helps kind of set the boundaries. You know, you, you always look at someone like, oh yeah, that guy has an untapped profile and he has like 4,000 check-ins. I'm not going to hire him. He's a drunk or something. Well, not an untapped. We value that. And obviously, drinking responsibly is very important to us. But we want you to be enthralled with the community and enthralled with everything that's coming through to our platform so you can make better decisions about in your own life. I mean, it, it's really important to have that kind of balance there from, from both sides. Yeah, indeed. Is it a fully remote team, the developers and the sales? Or how do we see that? So we started out as a, in our main headquarters in Wilmington, North Carolina. So for people are listening in, that is about four hours out of Charlotte, North Carolina, which is one of the major cities in North Carolina, close to the water. Uh, and that's kind of where our headquarters is. However, with COVID, we're all working remotely and have been since the 13th of uh, March. Um, we are turning into more of a remote company. Our engineers are all remote. Um, you know, our, uh, our CTO is remote. So we, we're, we're really embellishing our... Our, our technology engineering teams and product teams as remote teams. And that's kind of how we've operated that uh, yeah, recently. When did you notice that monetization was needed? From a hobby project, you invest a couple of hundred euros in it. And then right now we need to monetize something in it and make a company out of it. We were selling badges from the very beginning. Uh, Sam Adam was one of the first badges that, that uh, they, they bought and purchased, but we wanted server costs got are getting really high. We wanted a way for us to support those and not have to pull more money out of our own pockets for it. So we launched an untapped uh, supporter program, which allowed people to actually go in and purchase a subscription. That gives them a special badge, a, uh, a ribbon on, on their profile. It almost like a pro account, but not really. We didn't want to call it that because we didn't feel that it was a whole lot of features, but more of a way people can support the apps they want. We never uh, wanted to charge for the app. We never wanted to put ads in the app. That was not our intention of what we wanted to do. But So we wanted to create a way where people could sell like they could uh, buy stuff and, uh, and uh, get a special 
badge for supporting Untapped and go from that perspective. So um, that's kind of what we did from the very early on. I think it was 2014 when we we announced that. It helped us sustain until uh, 2016 when we kind of merged another company and, and kind of fully went went full time on it. Um, prior to that, from 2010 to 2016. I was working on it part-time, uh, nights and weekends, things of that nature. So we were about close to about two or 3 million users at the time, uh, when we did the merger. Uh, so we were managing 3 million users from a part-time job. It was very, very, uh, crazy to do all that from that perspective. Yeah. Cool. Uh, security wise and spam, you also get that, of course cheaters how how do you get them out is that algorithms in the beginning manual work or yeah in the beginning manual work but we've developed a strategy around that i mean we you know i don't want to get too deep into the details on that but I, I will say that um you know there is a very very small number of people that uh cheat for badges and that's kind of their own prerogative we just don't want their activity to be uh, you know, added in the analytics and things of that nature. Um, you know, we let them kind of play in their own world in a sense where, uh, we make sure that they are, uh, uh, able to do what they want to do, but they don't affect the overall public and overall rating scammers or account scammers, you know, stuff that I never thought I'd have to worry about while creating the service. Uh, we just kind of over time develop algorithms to detect these things. We have a review team that reviews for, so it's important to have an accurate platform on the system itself. So I'm happy that. We've been able to do that. We're never fully going to be able to stop every single user, but we can always iterate that process uh, going forward to make it better for everybody. Yeah, cool. You also have a responsible disclosure of you did a bug uh, bounty program. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to just basically let users know and be transparent about where the data is being used. And we talk about that in our privacy policy and things of that nature. Um, you know, we we firmly conform up the GDP, and if anyone wants to be able to have their account deleted, we fully uh, allow you to do that. We've had an open API you can go into and grab data from whatever you'd like. Um, you know, that's kind of our, our mission there is being able to be transparent and responsible with our data, but also with the user's activity on the site. So, you know, we really believe in, in drinking responsibly and being able to promote these things in a safe and healthy way. Um, uh, because basically the, 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 the sense here is that we wanted to really go forward and have a system in place where we're not promoting binge drinking or promoting over excessive times. Like sometimes people say to us, Hey, a brewery wants to sponsor a badge for drinking every one of their beers. And in hindsight, they're maybe thinking it's a great idea. I want to create this loyalty progress, but you don't want to send a message to someone saying, Hey, go to a brewery, try everything they have and then drive home. We just don't want any of that kind of uh, mentality from that perspective. So it's really important to be transparent about the data that we, that we use, where we use it for, how we use it. And also for responsibility for drinking, we don't do badges for things that are like drinking like 50 beers in one session. Like we don't want that kind of mentality either. So it's very important on uh, both sides. Yeah. If you look back to the 10 years of untapped, what was the most challenging thing? Uh, most challenging thing, I think, was scaling. hundred percent from that perspective. So, you know, you go to school, I went to computer, for computer science, I have a master's in IT. Uh, I, I, they don't teach you how, how this stuff works. They don't teach you how to write queries or systems for millions of years. They teach you how to write a query for 10 people and you get dinged on it on a test if it's not written the exact same way that does like a microsecond difference. Like, it, you know, when you have like 50 users and you run a query and it works fine, it works fine for 50, 100. When you go to a million users, that's when really it starts to kind of break down. So we worked a lot with our partners uh, before to kind of scale it up or get people that help us uh, work on it. I remember a story once where I was on a plane and untapped crash on a Friday and I remember having to wait for the plane to get on Wi Fi to be able to to switch or change things. So we wanted to create this system in a sense where we'd be able to kind of do this more effectively, but scaling was definitely the number one problem in my mind uh, as we, we wrote up. And lucky to say that we've been able to do a much better job of that going forward now, being on Amazon with auto scaling and things of that nature. Uh, what shows did you regret the most, technically? I'm not sure the a decision that I regretted. I, I, I will say that the app now with the badge system we're kind of kicking our, our own stuff in the teeth because people get really energetic about the badge system. And yet we've created this monster. Right? And like, it's like, okay. 
you know, this badge is going to be available only on this day. It's like, oh no, I really want it. I really, really want it. And you have to kind of give them a perception of, of, of how that works from that side. So yeah, some of the badge stuff I would change, but really I think we make good decisions throughout the entire progress. Uh, I would have probably moved off of our old whole super buyer first, moved AWS and used that from the very beginning from a technology perspective. It would have been a lot easier for us to migrate that early on. Um, our database is huge, so it takes a lot of uh, efforts to migrate that now. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that was the uh, one kind of thing from a technical perspective that I would have kind of switched from the very beginning. Did you think you disrupted the beer industry? And if yes, how? Yeah, absolutely. I think that a lot of it, the beer industry is inherently a platform where people are uh, less computer savvy and less social, but, um, less marketing from that perspective. And that's fine. I mean, nothing wrong with that in that aspect. But I think we've changed the the topic that, that allowed users to have a, a greater voice in terms of being able to tell breweries directly what they want and what they what they don't like. And I think before that, you as a brewer just put out product and hope that anyone would get it and your sales would go up. But now we're disrupting that kind of situation where. Uh, you are uh, basically going through the system in a sense where you are able to communicate directly with your customer. And in the U.S., we have a three-tiered system of a brewery, a distributor, and a, and a customer. And the brewery does not even know what the customer thinks about. So giving this platform for them to be able to communicate is a way we've, we think we've disrupted the industry from that perspective, for sure. What are any future plans that we can expect from Untapped this year? I think for us, we want to continue to build and improve the app from a performance perspective. I think that anytime you got to grow to the step that you're at right now, you always want to think back, refactor, try to improve upon. There's a lot of legacy code in Untap, a lot of things with the app that we want to improve, recommendations. I mean, we don't really use a true machine learning recognition engine. We have a, a system that I developed that basically kind of tracks beer where they're located, distribution maps, and recommends you similar beers to your taste profile. But we want to improve upon that experience as well, as, as well as more integration with our business products too, because one of the major benefits we have of having this massive community is we're able to tell people where beer is located. It's very difficult everywhere to kind of say, I want this beer, where can I find it? It's a very complicated question, but we don't think it should be complicated. So finding all the data attributes and the points to point a user directly to that is something that we're definitely working on to improve upon. And also just building more community-driven things. I mean, we we do a lot of events with the community. Uh, you know, last year, we did, or two years ago, we have a, a seven-city tour. We'll all travel to seven cities. We'll do seven events uh, all across the United States uh, based on the top checked in cities in a given month. We want to explore that international as well, but obviously with COVID that really can't travel from that perspective. So we're hoping that, you know, when the future calls, we'll have more media and more content we can be able to share um, to be able to do that from that perspective. Some very nice last word, Greg. Thank you a lot for the interview and wish you all the best. Thank you very much.